I'm here to talk about um, resilient translations and the receptions of resilient translations through time, obviously focusing on nowadays translations. So the title of my presentation here is um, The Ring Goes South, the resilient translations through time and the perceptions and receptions within fandom and scholarship. Well, um, usually I, I talk about Celtic elements and neo medievalism on, on nowadays societies, but today I'm trying to, to make uh, the same memory, cultural memory um, uh, explanation with token translations. And I think it's quite, um, quite the same, the process of understanding how memory culture uh, try to, to, to use those elements. Um, my, um, my job here is to make us think about the impact of translations in non-English communities like Brazil um, and how this could um, show us the impact of talking in our view of fantasy and literature and academic or even the most pop understandings of it. So, um, Brazil is a, okay. Uh, Brazil is a large country with a huge and even ferocious <laughs> groups of fans. We can find among Brazilians every single type of fan, actually. The scholar, the film fanboy, the curious reader, and of course, the pretentious pseudo writer. Everyone living their lives within different groups, societies spread through universities, coffee shops, libraries, and the internet, of course. The history and sociological memory from our Brazilian readers can be traced since the very first translation into our language in the 70s. And after that, with the new translations, uh, societies, and of course, the impact of the films in the early 2000s. To understand the impact of the new translations, we must first look into the old translations and their social background and try to, to understand how this talking memory culture is, is structured in Brazil. But it could be any other country, another country in the world. So let's talk a bit of history here. Um, the very first translation uh, in Brazil appeared with the Lord of the Rings between 1974 and 1979, divided into six books published by Arte Nova uh, publishers. Uh, Arte Nova means new art in Portuguese, just to, to know. Uh, a group with no official rights to translate it, and therefore with no acquaintance of the guide to the names or any sort of direction to translate it. The result of this work and the translations of the 1976 um, The Hobbit as well, uh, was a very hard group of books known by a few fantasy addicted people by the time and no more. And it's very interesting that the distranslations had no idea how to, to translate some places, names, and etc. For example, uh, Sam Ganji was translated as Sam Pacolet, as Pacolet is an, a word related to some kind of cotton producer, producers. And Gandalf, to be more Brazilian, is named as Gandalfo. So there is very interesting. Uh, changes in this very first Brazilian translation. You know, I have some of those books here with me. So uh, it's important. It's important to notice that by the early 70s, Brazil was under the rule of a dictator, and our society lived in a regime with a large censorship system. It means that books to be published here must pass a government examination and must cure Dune with the government's conservative uh, standards for our society. Fantasy books or medieval history books uh, were seen as part of this imagination status and therefore seen as a minor form of knowledge 
and literature and treated as well. And now it's very interesting to understand how these extremists, you know, the political extremists here in Brazil, um, use this kind of medieval, this kind of fantasy view of the past as a political flag. And it's very dangerous. Uh, uh, I think you, you must face it. It's a problem you have here in Brazil uh, about different groups trying to uh, make appropriations of, of this in a politi political sense. And the, 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 the more extremists here in Brazil try to use medieval or neo-medievalism, of course, and token as a political flag. Uh, recently, for example, uh, a politician um, tried to to create a law project to in, uh, to put uh, to create a token, some sort of token day. So, if you see the, the curriculum of the politician, there's no uh, there's no evidence of working with literature or fantasy literature or even token. Of course, they try to uh, capitalize uh, this neo medievalism with his political agenda. And it's very, very, very thorny a uh, subject. So that's why you need to, to face it. As a sociologist and historian, I think it's very important just to, to talk about it. So continue. Um, unsurprisingly, by the, the 80s, the majority of token readers in Brazil were made not by Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, but by the Portugal Portuguese version of the books imported in a process of reopening politics with the rest of the world and the end of the hard dictatorship period. Sociologically speaking, there was a desire to be part of the world and it explains the beginning of Tolkien's academic and fandom uh, life in Brazil in the 80s. By the time, the first research was made within an university using those books. Uh, o Senhor dos Anéis, Estrutura e Significado, in English, of course. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, Structure and Meaning, by Lucia Lima Polacchini in 1984. At, at, at the end of the decade, the now renowned translator Ronald Kirms founded the Heren y Aerman, uh, the Order of the South, the very first token society affiliated SMIL in Brazil and also in Latin America. And therefore, the Brazilian fans became more and more organized in groups. And it's interesting to point that Ronald Kearns is the oldest token society member in Brazil and holds now the responsibility for the newest translations of the Lord of the Rings in our country. Well, things become more organized by the 90s when the first official translations came to be published by Martins von Tisch Publishers, starting with the Humphrey Carter biography in 1992, before the, the talking, book, talking books, uh, followed by The Lord of the Rings in 1994, The Hobbit in 1995, and The Silmarillion in 1999. Uh, those translations uh, were renewing the major interest in fraud tokens books in Brazil, despite two major problems. The first problem is a question of understand, understanding in Brazilian perception of fantasy genre. It was a com commonplace to put in a less important form of art made for children with no deeper thoughts or valid academic status. The second problem tells about the translations itself, made by non scholarly specialists on the subject. And despite their technical expertise, they are very good translators. Uh, the translations lack of a broad understanding of Tolkien's mythology or even historical background. But besides that, those large printed editions consolidate uh, the author among an entire generation and helped produce in 1997 the very first PhD thesis written by Rosa Silvia Lopes entitled O Narrar Ritualístico em O Senhor dos Anéis de J.R.R. Tolkien. The Excuse me. Uh, the ritualistic narrative in G.R.R. Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, and of course, a more broad fandom community at the end of the 90s. You can see some of those books uh, on the slide. So, 
Um, eventually, through the 2000s, those groups became more and more intertwined. And the explanation was, in fact, three distinct things. First, the advent of the internet helping the fans from different parts of Brazil start their own fight for representation, affiliation, and other minor stuff. Second, the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy, a huge box office success in Brazil that helped it to change a little the way, the way how Brazilians watched fantasy productions, not only as a child stuff, but as a more profound and adult entertainment, uh, entertainment changing that pre 70s way of medieval uh, history and even literature and fantasy books. And it's very important for, because uh, from this um, year, from now, now on, um, more academics can to, to write. And third, the professionalization of the fan who started to publish academic books, to study talking at universities, and to promote with, uh, it with a Brazilian way of reading talking. It's very important to, to say it's a Brazilian way to read, read talking because our form of represent those characters are um, more late in America than of course, people from English speaking countries can assume. The, um, this professionalization is being responsible for organizing different academic events as symposiums, expos, and even open classes in large Brazilian universities in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. Uh, two years ago, we just organized a great um, event in our university, the Re in Rio de Janeiro Federal University. Um, and in Sao Paulo, lots of academic friends are working hard to try to make some, some lectures and try to uh, put token inside our universities. But the biggest change was promoted since 2018, when HarperCollins Brazil bought the rights to publish tokens books in Brazil from the former Martins Fonts editors. Uh, in publishers. The new editor's plans are very ambitious uh, with a commercial schedule to publish not only the new and unpublished works in, a, in our country, but also a whole new translation process of already uh, translated classics as The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and Cimmerillion, as you can see uh, on, this, on our panel here and slide, and PowerPoint here. Um, and the first books with the new translations begin to appear on bookshop shelves. Uh, part of the talking community became divided with the new words, new sentences, and of course, with the new possibilities. And that's the main reason why this paper is called The Ring Goes South, because the new translations started a kind of division in our group. And I think it's a, a very interesting vision because the arguing and the, the debate became more academic here. So let's uh, go for some uh, contemporary questions, of course. Um, the new editions, okay, uh, decided to use the professional fan type that appeared in the past decades in Brazil to make its new translations more accurate if you compared with the original English books. And it's very interesting that uh, translators as Ronald Kearns, uh, Reinaldo José Lopes, or Gabriel Brun, they are very professional and, and dedicated their whole, their whole life to understanding and make some, some translations of Tolkien. So they're part of what we can call a Tolkien memory culture in Brazil, okay? Um, the academic community of Tolkien scholars and Tolkien in general readers are, as I said, intertwined. And those new translators, and not only the translators, but all uh, the, the people involved in the revision and, and the art and etc., are very engaged with uh, this Tolkien community, this Tolkien cultural memory, collectively memory, in the past two decades, even more, if you see in front of the Kirms 
um, doing this work since the 80s. So, um, for that reason, you know, um, in an unprecedented way, they create a translation council with academics specialized in token to decide collectively the best way to translate a sentence or even a word or expression. And it's very unprecedented here in Brazil because we, we can hear about trans translations, councils, to uh, translating works like James Joyce or Shakespeare. But for the, for the first time, you have a translation council to translate Tolkien's works in Brazil. So the council, they organize with uh, the internet, with groups of discussing in internal forums, and they choose uh, to follow a foreignization form of translation. And starting with this option, they adapt, for example, some archaic sentences, as in the Cimmerillion, for an equivalent in archaic Portuguese, creating a closer experience with the original text as possible. Another modification within uh, the new translation, translations is related to words like orcs, goblins, and dwarves. The translations are that they are simply following the guide and the nomenclature of the Lord of the Rings, previously published in different books through time, like this. And doing so, they choose a more phonetic form of words like orc in our Portuguese, orque, goblin, or goblin, and troll in Portuguese, troll, changing some in some way for a more phonetic approach to our language, Portuguese. The same explanation was used uh, to collect it form of for a dwarf, dwarfs, anons, different from dwarfs, anoints in Brazilian Portuguese. You know, we have this difference between the, uh, the plural of dwarf. Uh, dwarfs, dwarfs, anons, anoints. They try to use and choosing a more ancient and archaic form as well for the first time. All those explanations were largely spread to the fans' communities, and it was equally accepted besides some groups more attached to the old translations um, decided to start a fandom crusade, arguing that those translations' choices were not choices, but real mistakes and a large disrespect with Tolkien's memory. Uh, and this is based in a, in a very interesting way in how communicative memory are divided in this, uh, within, this, uh, within Tolkien cultural uh, memory in Brazil. Because communicative memory is defined by two models, a generation exchange of ideas and a specific and contemporary witnesses within a proper group committed to a specific activity. When the new translations came, the new group divided from the ancient group, from the, the professional fans. And that's divide uh, the debate about if you like the new translations or not. And it's very interesting because when these crusade groups try to say that these new translations was a disrespect the token's memory, what are they trying to say, sociologically speaking, is that the only memory attacked in this process was their own affective memory, linked within a sort of communicative memory passing through them among the past decades and totally built among the old 90s translations. The more ironical in this context is that the, those old translations were full of text omissions and modifications differing largely from Tolkien's original writings. But besides those minor internet conflicts on collective memory perceptions, we can also see the development of a different form of social interaction galvanized by the new, by the new translations, the collections. After all, the new, uh, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings editions came in different covers, some cheaper, other more expensive, and suddenly a real collection market arose, not only to negotiate those new editions, but also to discover old and lost editions from 90s and 70s as well. 
To connect those different ideas and hypotheses, we decided to elaborate a survey among token fans within the internet. Spread to different, in different parts of Brazil, we gathered the opinions of more than a thousand readers, to be more precise, 1,046 readers. And as a result, we discovered that the majority of the most active members of the online community started reading Tolkien with the Martins Font publisher, and more than 70% considered themselves being a Tolkien book collector. The most interesting among those participants are the, the majority started their collection in the years 2000 or started from 2018. This piece of information can be related with two phenomena. First, the relevance of the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy and more recently, the new translations. And if you keep that in information in mind, it is not a surprise that part of this more effectively and effectively attached people with the old translations, more specifically the Martin Fontes translations, also had their first contact with those worlds at the movies, watching the movies, which by that time used the published text material for subtitles or dubbed material. So the more experience create part of this fandom, uh, the same part that now tries to come back to an old affective memory crystallized in that specific past, creating a supergroup of segregationally communicative memory in conflict with the main talking Brazilian memory culture that translated for the new groups. As you can see in the graphics here, okay? Um, so, as I said previously, there is not a majority. After all, when, when we ask them if the new worlds as orcs, goblin, or anons bothering them, 60% uh, answered no. And those almost 40 who answered yes, more than a half just justifying saying that they prefer the old translations just because they are more familiarized with the new or that they remember the first time reading or even the movies. So summarizing the subject, you can relate the, our hypothetical explanations here with some real material based on the survey or more specific with the interviews among the fandom. Uh, what we realized then with a certain surprise is that most of them tend to compare the different translations, even the Portuguese from Portugal and Europe America ones and to use the Tolkien's guide to the names in the Lord of the Rings as a parameter for of quali quality among collectors and the new rise of collections fed either by the old movies affection or the new HarperCollins translations within their textual and visual changes. But not only the collections uh, are, raised, are rising up with this new scenario, with the new books and translations, as we can verify it, old fan groups spreading their activities, promoting the new book launches, the talks, quizzes, competitions, art, etc. We can see a very interesting social synergy between the editors and publishers and groups, the academic translators and the fan base in general. And it all began in 2018 with the Fall of Gondoli translation, launched on the very same day as the English edition worldwide. After that, different groups in Brazil begins to promote activities among fans and even the last year with all the pandemic that took the world by assault, those groups continue to promote their activities at an online platform as well. The results are clear from for the editors and publishers, the large selling success of fantasy books reaching the top 10 in charts, a, a very unusual achievement in Brazil book scenario. And for the fans, new groups, internet profiles, new forms of interaction, podcasts, YouTube channels, and even heated debates between the defenders of the old translations and the ones who embraced the new text uh, appeared in Brazil. Historically and sociologically, we are witnessing a gradual change in the perception of the token deal community here, and the new translations are part of this process. Different actors among the fans, the academics, and editors are moving, in, uh, and it seems that the straight road on the, is on the horizon. For sure. So that's all that I need to talk with you today. I'm waiting for the questions and a great thank you for everyone here watching.
our presentation. Thank you very much, um, Eric. Um, lo <laughs> lots of energy and re a really fascinating insight into how um, to the uh, the Tolkien fan base has re really uh, grown as well. And that, like you said, there's that divide um, as well that's been in place. So thank you very much um, as well. And yes, we noticed your Lord of the Rings mug as well. So um, we just have one or two questions for you uh, as well. So let's open those questions up. Um, one person, uh, yes. So our first question uh, asks, who created uh, the artwork and the cover for the um, Brazilian uh, covers? Uh, the new editions from Alex is a very competent artist um, and the uh, old ones are based um, in some uh, previous works um, worldwide. So it's interesting because all the, 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 the art must pass through the token state as well, so they they are largely based on how to, to produce it. But the new ones are made from Alex, and they try to to use tokens, uh, original drawings, um, to promote it. Um, I I might jump on that with my own question. Is there a reason why they went specifically for Tolkien's own drawings rather than um, request new? Um, art. I think they, they try to uh, make a more uh, an approach more close to original text. So when they choose to make a foreignization form of translation, they try to also to up to get close to the more uh, English uh, original forms of covers as well. So more of an authentic authentic text by the yeah by kind kind of kind of okay. Thank you. Um, okay, and next one. Do you think there are specific themes from Tolkien's work that particularly resonate with Brazilian culture, either today or when the translations were first introduced in historical context? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's different points of view, of view here uh, because, you know, the way Tolkien treats uh, nature, for example, are uh, 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 there's a great appeal here in Brazil. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, of people engaged with um, biological studies and, and that like Tolkien here. And there's some major points here. Um, of course, uh, we believe that uh, the Tolkien's message is kind of, of universal. So besides that, uh, the debates are more approached with our reality. But uh, as I said, there's a very Brazilian way of reading Tolkien, not only with the nature, but also uh, with the, the message of resilience, of, of trying to, to resist some, uh, uh, some problems that we have, uh, even political ones, of course. Thank you. Um, and then a, a final one, perhaps uh, less, less serious question. Um, a more light-hearted question just for us to end on. Is there um, a funny mistranslation in the Brazilian editions? So a funny mistranslation. Mistranslations. Uh, I don't know it's mistranslations, but there's some omissions, for example, as oh. I said. Uh, and Martin Sponge's translations in the 90s, for, uh, they, they, um, uh, there's some omission on Saruman rings, Saruman creating rings. So for an entire generation of people here in Brazil have no idea that Saruman uh, tried to create rings, for example, because there is an omission. And there's some parts, there's also omissions of, of thoughts because some people try to, to translate uh, the way people speak in the same way. So that the uh, hobbits and elves and man talks in a very plain the same way. So the new translations now trying to, trying to, to, uh, to be more close to the, to the English uh, to, uh, text. So they changing the way elves and hobbits talk uh, with them, with each other. So it's, there's a, some kind of things that is, we can call it a, a, a different way of translation. So 
something like that. Oh, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much.